I assume. All right, so thank you for being here. Uh, I'm Keith Stevens. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for PG&E and the P Public Information Officer for this event. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Also want to thank our team here who's uh, joined us to provide uh, ASL interpretation for us. That's some feedback we got throughout some of the previous uh, briefings, so thank you for that. And we appreciate both Jim and Jewel who are here interpreting for us tonight. Um, as we've done in the previous events, we're going to have a few speakers, some prepared remarks, and then we'll take all the questions for anyone who's here. A reminder, we do have a phone line. We do have a big service territory, so we have people dialed in from across the state. So we'll ask you to just hold your questions. We'll bring mics to you. We're going to take all questions. want to make sure your awesome TV or radio voice is heard so that we can answer your questions and have them make sense. Uh, so let's begin with safety. Um, we're uh, going to have an incident commander who is Erin Garvey. She's over here to the left. Rick Metafasser is CPR certified, and he's willing to do CPR. Tom Schmitz is going to get our AED, which is back at the audiovisual table. And Deborah Scales, who is back there also, will cover um, uh, corporate security and contact them if needed. I'm going to apologize up front. I'm a fast talker, so I will slow down a little bit. Uh, finally, uh, we are in earthquake country, so if we need to uh, prepare ourselves for an earthquake, we have lights above our head. So uh, please be prepared to duck, cover, and hold. If we need to get out of this room, we're going to exit through these two exits over here. And then we'll proceed to Bechtel Plaza across the street. And if that's not safe, we will then proceed to the Embarcadero Plaza at the end of market. Finally, um, active shooter situations are all too real. If we find ourselves in one of these situations, we should attempt to get out, hide out, and take out. Um, we have a media line for anyone on the phone who needs to answer, ask questions. That's 415-973-5930. And we envision things going about 30 minutes tonight like they did last night. Um, our lineup tonight will be our principal meteorologist, Scott Strenfell. He'll start us off. We will then um, have uh, comments from our PG Corporation President and CEO, Bill Johnson. We'll also have some remarks by our Deputy Incident Commander, Mark Quinlan, and then we'll go to questions. So with that, I'm going to ask Scott to come up. Thank you, Keith. So as uh, anticipated by global and uh, high resolution weather models, we do have high pressure building to our north and east of the territory. And it is starting a period of gusty and dry north to northeast winds across uh, northern California. Uh, we are seeing wind speeds that start to ramp up uh, in some locations are already gusting uh, 30 to 40 miles per hour uh, in the North Bay, Sacramento Valley and higher terrain in the Sierra. I'm just looking at one station from Mount St. Helena about three seconds ago on my, or three minutes ago, excuse me, on my mobile phone. It was showing gusts of 41 miles per hour with uh, really low relative humidity. A very dry air mass is also, also filtering into California uh, from the north. And right now we see numerous readings uh, in the teens to uh, single digits across many weather stations in Northern California. And so this combination of, of wind low humidity and dry fuels on the surface is leading to conditions that according to the National Weather Service could produce extreme fire behavior and also high risk of significant fires according to the Northern Operations Predictive Services across vast portions of, of Northern California and into Southern California. So this wind event does look like it's a California-wide California, California -wide, uh, phenomenon. This is expected to transition across the south half of the state uh, later tonight, uh, Thursday into Friday. Our uh, utility to the south, SoCal Edison, according to their website, is considering a PSPS event for about 300,000 customers as well. So it is a California-wide uh, phenomenon and a risk of uh, significant fires across vast portions of California. Um, the Northern California event that we are heading into is expected to uh, peak overnight tonight. Uh, we are expecting the winds to taper off for Northern California, uh, kind of in that 10 a.m. to noon time frame. 
And at that time, we'll be looking at our more than 600 uh, weather stations across the territory, um, as well as other intel from our high resolution cameras and also field crews that are placed strategically out in the field in order to determine and recommend an all clear so that our crews can begin to uh, restore power for um, Northern California. Across the south, it does look like the, <coughs> excuse me, the winds are gonna taper off in, in uh, Friday about from about 10 to noon, so that's when we expect to issue the all clear about uh, noon on, on Friday. Um, looking ahead, unfortunately, uh, for all of us, we do appear to be stuck in a weather pattern uh, that is conducive to these uh, offshore wind patterns. And we are looking at and continuing to monitor a second period of offshore winds that may impact Northern California Saturday night through Monday afternoon. Uh, some of the forecast models that we look at, such as the uh, European uh, model, suggests that this could be the strongest wind event of the season, unfortunately, and potentially stronger than the October 9th through 11th uh, PSPS event. Uh, just a word of caution, we're still several days out from that event, so things could still evolve, but right now it's looking like potential for a, to be a significant event. Um, to add on to that, uh, fuels at the surface are expected to dry out with this event that we're going through right now. And so we don't anticipate any significant recovery in fuel moistures for this second event. So we're anticipating fuels to be as dry, if not drier, than what we've seen all year this year. So it, it could have the potential to be a very significant event uh, this weekend. Um, North Ops Predictive Services is, is already forecasting high risk of significant fires for this weekend event. They have high risk across multiple public uh, predictive service areas in Northern California. And in talking with the National Weather Service uh, today, they are anticipating issuing fire weather watches and red flag warnings for this upcoming event as well. Uh, pg e Meteorology continues to closely coordinate with our federal forecast agency partners, and I mentioned some of those, Predictive Services, as well as National Weather Service. And I do encourage you to evaluate and, and check out their forecast. Some of them are available at weather.gov, and you can find the uh, North Ops Predictive Services out there uh, if you search. Um, so that's it for weather, and turn it back to you, Keith. Thank you. Bill? <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Johnson, the President and CEO of PG&E Corporation. A few hours ago, we initiated a public safety power shutoff across portions of the Sierra foothills and the North Bay. We also expect to turn off power for small parts of San Mateo and Kern counties after midnight tonight, probably around 1 a.m. In total, these shutoffs will affect about 179,000 customers and touch portions of 17 counties. We made this decision in response to a dangerous combination of hot, dry, and windy conditions in those areas I just mentioned, which together increased the risk of damage and sparks on the electric system, which in turn has the potential to cause catastrophic wildfire. We don't ever want to see any more of those, and so that's why we do these kind of things. I want to note that not everyone who is out of power will experience the strong winds that Scott talked about. This is because the electric system relies on power lines working together to provide electricity across cities, counties, and the entire state. So think of the system as a large spider web of lines going in every direction. And regardless of whether you're seeing windy conditions in your location, dangerous conditions affecting the system exist somewhere that's connected to you. So that's why you might not see it, but you will experience it. You know, our first responsibility at PG&E is to keep everyone safe, our neighbors, their families, the communities that we share. And that's the only reason we do this, to protect human life. We understand the hardship caused by these shutoffs and the safety issues that it brings with it. But we also understand the heartbreak and devastation of catastrophic wildfire. Those losses are forever, and we're determined to do everything in our power to prevent them. As we do that, we also want to keep everybody informed about our safety shutoff so people can know whether they will be affected and for how long. So let me say how we're doing this. First, we're working in lockstep with our state agencies, including Cal OES, the CPUC, and Cal Fire, 
many of whom are with us here personally in our emergency operations center. To them I say thank you. We have also involved all of the county, local, and tribal governments in the impacted areas, holding briefing calls with those folks three times a day. Our main web page, pg&e.com, which has all of the customer resources and tools such as address lookup, lookup outage maps, and downloadable map files, is fully operational and working normally. Our customer notifications by email, text, and phone went out at 48, 24, and four hours in advance for the vast majority of customers impacted. If we didn't meet that exact time frame, it was because of changes to the forecast that caused slight changes to the scope of the event. Our call centers are fully staffed with very short wait times. And overall, we want all of our customers and communities to be aware of the tools and information we offer. We encourage customers to sign up to receive automated notifications when a PSPS is called in their community. And I want to emphasize this point because it now appears, as Scott mentioned, that there'll be another round of safety shutoffs this weekend into early next week. The timing isn't clear yet. Um, and I'll have more to say that at, at the end of the briefing. So on social, there's this uh, story swirling that we intend to keep power out for the entire two events, that it will be close together so we won't restore, we'll just let the power be out. That is not true. We expect to have the all clear in most of this area by midday tomorrow. I think in current midday Friday, but we will be getting restoration immediately and intend to restore everybody before the next potential event gets here. Now, I want to say something very important to the many thousands of pg and &E employees and contractors who work hard every day and who are now out in the field preparing to do the hard work of inspecting our system and restoring power. Thanks for your work. Be careful, be safe, and look out for each other. I say this because earlier today, one of our employees in Glen County was the target of what appears to be a deliberate attack. Floyd was driving a PG&E vehicle when a projectile hit the front passenger window. Our security team believes that projectile to be a pellet from a pellet gun. So thankfully the employee was not injured. Law enforcement and our own security people are looking into this. But let me say this directly. There is no justification for this sort of violence. Whenever you see any of our crews anywhere in our community, your community, they're there to help. They're there specifically to help you. They're not anonymous strangers. They're your neighbors. They're your friends. Most of our frontline employees live in the communities where they work. So I understand these shutoffs can make people upset and even angry. But be upset at PG&E. Don't take it out on the people that are trying to help you. Uh, with that, I think I'll turn to Mark Quinlan for an operational update. Uh, thank you, Bill. Good evening, everybody. I'm Mark Quinlan. I'm the incident commander uh, for this public safety power shutoff event, here to provide an operational update. Um, Bill had mentioned uh, final scope uh, of the shutoff was approximately 179,000 customers. Um, that's roughly 143,000 in the Sierra Foothills uh, area of our service territory, roughly 36,000 in the North Bay. Uh, less than a thousand in San Mateo and less than a hundred in Kern counties. Um, we began our shutdown shortly after 1400 hours or 2 p.m. Uh, per our plan. Uh, we needed uh, to have our system in the de-energized state uh, prior to 5 p.m. or 1700. Uh, we successfully executed that plan and, and those sections of the Sierra Foothills and the North Bay are now uh, de-energized and will remain that way until the all clear, uh, which we believe will be at noon tomorrow to Bill's uh, point. In terms of um, the scope and how we reduced it, uh, we were able to continue to further sectionalize our system and perform switching operations to limit customer impacts. We were also able to secure backup generation for a few communities. Uh, specifically Angwin, uh, Placerville, uh, Calistoga, and Grass Valley. 
altogether slightly above 5,000 customers uh, are able to be restored via uh, backup generation. Our crews are in the process of executing that now. Uh, so uh, in terms of next steps for us, it's all about uh, monitoring the weather conditions throughout the evening part of this operational period. Uh, our team will be working closely with the meteorology team to monitor the wind activity. Right now that uh, activity is, is forecasted to uh, turn to our favor and wind conditions uh, dropping below the, uh, the dangerous levels and dangerous speeds at approximately 12 noon tomorrow. Uh, we will be in a posture uh, to take action earlier uh, if wind conditions uh, improve earlier than forecasted. Right now we have a number of our field personnel in the field. <clears throat> they are in the process of sectionalizing our system, segmenting our system, breaking it up into smaller uh, pieces, placing it into a posture uh, that is safe uh, and more readily available to be restored quickly. Um, this also allows us to pre-position our resources at each of those uh, specific locations on our system in advance of the all clear. That way when we get it, it's immediate communication to the field resources and we can start our patrol uh, and restoration process. So along that line, um, we have roughly 8,000 miles of distribution uh, overhead system to patrol and roughly 650 miles of transmission system to patrol. We intend to do that uh, via foot, via ground, and via air. From an uh, air resource perspective, we have 42 helicopters uh, that are in position and ready uh, to begin that, re that uh, patrol sequence. We have approximately 6,000 field resources that will be in position to perform the ground patrols. Uh, and then we also, as mentioned last night at this briefing, uh, we've been working closely with Cal OES to secure a fixed wing aircraft uh, with some new technology, a high resolution camera with some infrared technology uh, that allows us to see our transmission system uh, in, at, at night. We performed a test in the Auburn area yesterday and uh, the results of that were favorable. So we are going back up in the air this evening and we're going to be doing more patrols of our system uh, just to confirm uh, damage locations. We expect the winds to pick up uh, over the overnight hours. Uh, we believe that we can fly our transmission system and just look for any obvious uh, damage locations, vegetation blowing into our right-of-ways and impacting our facilities. That will give us a uh, an advance notice to, to station and mobilize repair crews uh, to address those issues. Um, we will again uh, uh, start that patrol sequence tomorrow when we get the formal all clear and then once uh, that patrol is complete we will restore people uh, to normal service. Uh, we are anticipating uh, a 48 hour uh, range if you will for our estimated time of restoration. Uh, this um, uh, this builds into that uh, estimate the potential for finding damage on our system. As you recall, we uh, identified several areas of damage, about 130 cases from the last PSPS event. We expect to find damage uh, associated with this event as well. Uh, not quite as high, uh, but we uh, just want a message to everybody that uh, our estimate uh, bakes in time for uh, repair activity for any damage that we find. Uh, on the customer front, uh, we have uh, sent out another communication to customers that exist in the San Mateo and the Kern counties uh, just to confirm uh, that uh, we intend to execute PSPS uh, shortly after midnight. Uh, we need to have those areas of the service territory de-energized by 0, 0200 hours. Um, we intend to send a final communication to them around 8 p.m. this evening, uh, letting them know so that our customers and the uh, agency partners can make plans. Um, we have opened uh, 28 community resource centers. Uh, all of them will be open tomorrow. Uh, the hours of operation are 8 in the morning until 8 in the evening. Uh, we did yesterday uh, reach out to all of the counties that were affected and uh, we asked if there was any interest in opening any of those counties 
earlier today, we received some interest in that area, so we opened six community resource uh, centers uh, today. Uh, they'll be open until 8 p.m. So um, one final note before I turn it back to Bill. I just uh, appreciate uh, the patience uh, on behalf of our customers. We recognize that uh, you know power outages are very inconvenient. We recognize that uh, you know <clears throat> they um, cause a lot of disturbance to what normal uh, routines uh, and normal life brings. We fully understand that. We're impacted by that as well. Uh, you have our commitment that we're working as hard as we can to safely restore you to service. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Bill. Thank you, Mark. As all three of us have mentioned, I think we continue to monitor and prepare for an additional wind event starting this weekend. Early forecasts show this has the potential to be widespread in our region with significant winds. Uh, we have updated our seven-day PSPS forecast that's available on our website, showing elevated risk of a safety shutdown beginning late Saturday. So we're continuing to coordinate with our agency partners in preparing for this. And as we get more data and a clear view of the weather in coming days, we'll keep everybody informed. And I think with that, we'll take your questions. Hold on for one second. We, we need to grab a microphone so everybody can hear you. So we'll bring, bring it to you. Yeah. Hi, it's Bob Butler at KCBS. You said the power was going to go out around 3 o'clock today. We had people out there where the power went out like 45 minutes early. They were caught off guard. This is in the North Bay. Can you kind of talk about that? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. Um, I can provide some context behind that. So we've been messaging that uh, the need to have everybody uh, de-energized and our system de-energized was 5 p.m. In order to do that successfully, we need uh, to... Uh, scheduled time to actually perform the switching operations, whether we're you know, operating devices in our control centers or we're having uh, field employees uh, underneath switches and devices in the, in the field. So we allowed for some extra operating time, operating margin, if you will, in order to do that system. So our original forecast was that the Sierra Foothill region would start at 2 and the North Bay area start at 3. Uh, that came with the uh, understanding that if weather conditions changed, uh, either for the good uh, or uh, not to the good, that we would adjust that timing. Uh, we were monitoring that in real time and uh, felt the need. We saw a little increase in the wind conditions with our field observers that were in the field, as well as the several weather stations that we have. Uh, so we executed uh, with enough time to complete by five, and we were successful in that effort. People weren't notified. People said they got no notification the power was going to go out. They, they were supposed to get an hour's notification. They got none. All of a sudden, the power went out. So I would, I would say walking through our customer notifications, everyone who is currently in scope for this event received a 48-hour notice, a 24-hour notice, and a zero to four-hour notice, and those were all going out. The two previous days and then again this morning. So those were all being communicated via phone, via text, and via email. Hey Bill, um, so, we, so we have some viewers um, who did get a notice in Sonoma County that the power was going out at three o'clock, yet it did go early. They thought the power was going out, but then it, it went much earlier. Big shock to them, uh, they are upset about that. How did that happen? Well, let me try again what Mark said. During the step up to these events, we're using forecasted weather. So we're making a forecast and then we're giving notices based on the forecast. When we get closer in, we go to real time observation. And so as we we're getting closer to that time, we could see the weather changing quicker than we had predicted. And so that's why we went a little bit early, because the weather got here a little bit earlier than we had thought in the forecast. And so people should, should just take that as a range and be ready earlier, you're thinking? So we try to be precise, but it's hard to be precise about when the winds start blowing. So yes. We are getting a lot of frustration on the part of our viewers and the rate payers. Um, they say that they are doing their job by paying their bill every month. I want to get to the root cause. How do we get to the point where the choice is, are houses going dark? or some houses going up in flames. How did we get here? It's a stark choice, but that is the choice. 
Um, you know, the risk, the fire risk has grown exponentially, particularly in this region, in the last couple of years. 2012, 15% of our service area was designated high fire threat. This year, 52%, a more than a threefold increase in the geography of risk in that period of time. And so these uh, events for us, they don't have anything to do with the quality of our system, with the vegetation management. They are pure weather related, blowing stuff out of the forest into our lives. So that's really what the story is. Well, I got to tell you that the governor doesn't buy it. I mean, he told me last night that this is the result of decades of greed, that if you had covered the wires in higher high fire threat areas, if you had done the vegetation more severely, if you had undergrounded wires years and years ago, that we wouldn't be at this point. Were the maintenance dollars spent well over the past decades? And I, and I know you haven't been here that long. You've been here you know, less than a year, and I've heard that from me before. But we have to address how we got here. Should pg and &E have done more to fix their system, to upgrade it, as, so we wouldn't be where we are right now? Actually, I've been here less than six months. And uh, I'm not evading your question. I don't have a basis to answer. And I really didn't come here to cast stones going backwards. I came here to be helpful going forward. And that's, well, helps I can tell you, yes, since I got, got here, here right? since I got here, I think the uh, maintenance and all those other dollars have been very well spent and are reducing the risk of this every day. Right. But, but should we, could we have done more? I mean, San Diego started in 2007, upgrading their system, doing their targeted blackouts in much smaller numbers. They've been at this over a decade. Why didn't we do it quicker? The risk in Southern, so San Diego Gas and Electric is the gold standard in California for this. They got it earlier because they had the fires earlier. And historically, fire risk in Southern California was much higher than in Northern California. And if you look at the trajectory of sort of decision-making and commentary, as late as 2017, most people didn't think the risk was very high in Northern California, including the regulators. So the risk ex really accelerated. And, the, and so we're dealing with that risk now with a system that was built for really a different climate. I totally hear you. My, my last follow-up here is, is that, I mean, as you know, um, we've got 25,000 miles of, of wire and high fire threat areas. This year, we are replacing 100 uh, miles of that with the hardened, with the covered wire. Next year is projected for about 700 miles. So that leaves, you know, 24,000 miles uncovered for the years to come. Yeah. Are you speeding up that process? We are, and 150 miles this year, 750 the next year. What we're also doing is doing it in the highest risk areas. So it's just not a mile covered equals 1% reduction, right? Mm -hmm. We're doing this in an orderly fashion. But the system is huge. I mean, it's 70,000 square miles with tens and tens of thousands of wires, miles of wires. Uh, this is a huge undertaking. It's going to take some time. Thank you. Thank you. Come on over, Christian. Christian Captain here from KTV Channel 2 uh, over here. I don't know if this question is best addressed to Bill or to Keith, so I'll address to both of you. Wondering how, uh, you, what your assessment is of the warning system, in particular the website, and getting that warning system out. Uh, there are some reports, again, that it worked better this time, so I'm wondering if there was a flaw in the system before, if that's been addressed, uh, to change the system so that it's able to uh, notify people in a timely fashion if they're going to be impacted by a shutdown. So I think the simplest way to say this is the website is working well, stable, and we're handling all the incoming. Uh, in the last event, we underestimated what the incoming would be. And we had a lot more traffic than we expected, and that's sort of what made it crash. But uh, we heard a lot about that from the governor and the commission and others and from our own self. And uh, it's uh, working well now. Can you talk about San Mateo County briefly? Some folks are getting um, messages that they won't be impacted. Uh, you mentioned that there will be another update at 8 o'clock. Is there, is there still narrowing going on? What, what can we expect tonight? So um, thank you for the question. Um, <clears throat> the process, uh, right before we notify customers, we uh, confer with our partners in meteorology, and we look for any opportunities, any changes in the weather. Uh, we also continue to look for segmentation and sectionalization opportunities that we've discussed previously. Um, so right now, uh, our, our posture is to monitor the weather. If the weather conditions change favorably for us, meaning we can delay the shutdown, then we will delay the shutdown because we don't want to 
turn people off unnecessarily uh, where we can avoid so. Uh, on the flip side of that equation, if the winds pick up a little higher in, in the county uh, than expected, then we intend to de-energize a little earlier. So what we want to do is communicate to our customers uh, in advance of, you know, what I would call the curfew time, the time where people usually, um, you know, go, go to bed for the evening. We want to reach our customers and let them know that based on what we see at that time, we intend to execute and, and shut off. Uh, but there's always that opportunity to adjust the plan in real time. That's what the team does in the Emergency Operations Center. Hi, Monica with the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, given the possibility of a wider and a possibly uh, much worse shutoff this weekend, how exactly can you ensure or say that the customers that are affected uh, with the shutoffs today are not going to be affected over the weekend, so there's not going to be any overlap? Right, so our plan, given the projected all clear, is that we will have everybody restored uh, who could be affected by the second one uh, before it happens. So our plan is to hook everybody back up and then at some point see what those forecasts actually lead to, but we intend to restore everybody. Obviously, uh, J.R. Stone with Cron 4. Obviously, maybe we're chasing weather patterns here, but why the shutoffs in some of the North Bay Hills and the Sierra Foothills, but not the East Bay Hills or the South Bay Hills, when some of those warnings and watches have been seen in some of those areas, the other areas that still have electricity? So that's a, that's a good point. Uh, thanks for raising it. So the National Weather Service has issued a red flag warning for you know, many of the, the, the area, the, our service territory, specifically the East Bay Hills, South Bay. Really what this comes down to is wind speeds, right? Um, northerly winds, northeasterly offshore winds. And our forecasting uh, methodology that Scott and the meteorology team have uh, gives us that insight in terms of predicting where the winds will be and how strong they will be. So although red flag warnings are uh, encompassing a lot of our service territory, they're not the single um, trigger, if you will, to execute PSPS. We look at a number of different things, uh, most significantly fuel conditions and, and wind and humidity. And uh, right now the North Bay is at a higher risk than the East or South Bays. Also, you made mention about the 28 community resource centers, which was good to hear about and I think so useful to people out there, but it still doesn't sound like there are any 24 hours resource centers um, because people now aren't able to cool down their homes, which could be hot. Is there that thought or even conversation going on right now? From a CRC perspective, um, I'll we, we are, well, let's just put it this way, we've received requests uh, dating back to the previous PSPS event to extend the operational hours of those centers and we've taken, taken the advantage to do that, so we've extended uh, the hours to 8 p.m. Have not received any requests to my knowledge uh, to go 24-7 uh, with that, um, so that's what I have at, that at, at this time. Back to Jean. <clears throat> Uh, you mentioned you have portable generators set up in some communities, uh, Calistoga, Angwin. How many portable generators do you have and how many other communities can you turn on? I would guess some folks will be calling you requesting that service. So the portable generation, um, backup generation uh, strategy for these communities is large utility scale generation. This isn't something, um, you know, that you can go to a you know, a, a Home Depot or a store like that and connect a house and feed critical load. This is utility scale. So it involves several megawatts of generation that are typically connected at the 12,000 volt level, um, primary generation. Um, we contract with uh, a number of different vendors that uh, have generators uh, available for use. And, and it's part of our forward-looking resilience plan. We've talked a little bit in previous conferences about some of our plans moving forward, like hardening the system and sectionalizing the system. Uh, also included in that plan is building more resilient zones and pre-connection, pre-interconnection uh, hubs. And, and what we're doing in places like the, the communities that I mentioned are looking to do just that. 
You have communities that exist uh, that the downtown area where you know most businesses are open, schools, churches, things of that nature uh, are in a, a safe zone, if you will, from a fire perspective. It's just a lot of sidewalks, streets, pavement, um, not not wooded, heavily wooded communities. But um, what we're finding is that you know out in the foothill regions and in the mountainous areas, you have a lot of a lot of cities like that. They are fed from transmission assets that traverse through rough country, you know, very heavily wooded country. So the entire uh, city center is surrounded by extreme fire danger, but there's an opportunity to energize, um, you know, the folks in, in this downtown areas. Uh, the, it's, we can't do that if we have to remove the transmission source because you need a transmission source in order to energize distribution. So. Our plan is to look for those opportunities, and those towns that I mentioned are good uh, candidates for that application. And what that involves, our engineering teams, we have a team that's dedicated for resilient zones. Uh, they go out and they scope the area. We walk uh, the area with the local authorities from the fire department, with our experts, our public safety specialists, and identify safe zones within the city center. Then we install either temporary or permanent infrastructure that allows us to isolate that city center and then quickly install generation. So there's a plan for that to install uh, several resilient zones or interconnection hubs over you know, the, the next five years. Uh, these PSPS events are bringing an opportunity to us to do this in real time on an emergent basis, even though we might not have the whole community set up and scoped um, completely, we're working it in real time on an emergency basis through the EOC. So it's just an example of what we're doing moving forward. Can they expect to have that generator in place for the next PSPS? That is our intent. And can someone talk about the scope of what you're looking at over Sunday through the, into next week? You, you're saying it's, it's a, a larger wind event. Any uh, estimate of how many customers will be affected? So it's too, <clears throat> it's too soon to to say anything about what the estimate is. You can look on the website and see what we think might happen, but I think we have a much better look at this about this time tomorrow. We're still 72 hours out, so I know Scott's gonna be getting data overnight and into tomorrow, and I'll be able to provide more granularity there. <clears throat> Earlier you mentioned that when you went out to inspect the lines after the last power safety shutdown, you found damage and you expect to find more this time, maybe not as much. What kind of damage are we talking about? Damages that we typically found were um, wires down on the ground, uh, tree branches that uh, were blown into our facilities, that type of damage. So that's typically what we find in these big wind events, just debris into our facilities. Anybody else? Last questions? Again, I want to thank our team of uh, Jim and Jewel for helping us with uh, interpretation today. Uh, again, we thank everyone for the feedback that we received on that. And we'll be back here tomorrow at 5.30 to provide you uh, an update with what's going on. Hopefully have some good restoration numbers for you. Thanks. Bye.